face to face and today I'm with Julia and we're going to talk about theater, play, uh, books, writing. Julia, welcome to face to face. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> so you study art, you study play, you study writing, you study political issue and you try to combine art, play, theater and to politics. Yes, and philosophy. And philosophy, yes. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> all of it, all of it. Exactly. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. So how you do it? What what is the the challenge? Uh, well, I, I, the challenge is to um, put them all together. Yeah. I, and as I mentioned earlier when we were talking before, I got involved with theater when I was very young. Mm -hmm. And then I got involved with politics and I didn't know how to put them together. And then I discovered um, the open theater, which actually uh, I discovered it later in my life, uh, later than it had been emerged. Um, with Joseph Chaikin, and I discovered that you could put the two together. Okay. And then I started as a director, creating pieces uh, based on an ensemble idea, so how you put it together became as important as what came out of it. Uh, and then eventually I started writing, as I mentioned, uh, and I started writing texts that could work uh, in a way that I wanted text to work with theater so it wasn't the only thing. It wasn't like this text god. It was like a text palette that then I could use uh, with actors to create something in an ensemble way. But, but why are you concerned about having the, the writing and the play be linked to social or into political? What is the relationship? Because you, you have a lot of play where we are not necessarily <laughs> going on that uh, direction. So. Well, as, as we always say, and I'm sure you've heard before, you know, if, if a theater says that it's not political, it is, it's, it's agreeing with the politics of, of the time, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. So, uh, starting with Brecht and on, uh -huh. and Arto, we were talking mm -hmm. about, you know, you, you begin to see people who are rebelling a bit against their time, and what better place to do it than in a room with a group of people uh, live, in my opinion, uh, though a lot of film has been really amazing. But uh, in terms of uh, changing perceptions, and as we mentioned, as I was saying, if, if, if you see somebody differently at the end or you see a situation differently, it, the situation. It, it changes your idea of what can be changed. It changes your idea of what is static and is it, oh, this is the way it is, nothing can ever change? Or do you leave the theater thinking maybe things can shift? So for you, the theater is that place of transformation. Yes. That's, that's what that's what produces a transformation to, uh, from a, a static image to a dynamic yeah. and moving situation. Yes, absolutely. That's, that's how you will define the theater? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, and I come very much from a lineage in the United States of like the living theater and the mm -hmm. open theater and mm -hmm people that were doing that, and then I've created my own version, obviously that's not the same, um, but I think that, I really feel like it can affect how we perceive somebody as other or somebody as fully human. And I think that that's also where women come <laughs> into play. That uh, was having my next women, question, yeah. what, 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 what is it? No, no, but what is it about uh, how can it be used or who has been used for to transform the the human the, the woman profile into a society who has been abused for Ever, thousands, basically. Or thousands <laughs> of years. I mean, you have a couple of yeah. moments in history where it was not the case, but mainly, yeah. 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 Well, I think that. I mean, part of it's just having women there, you know. I mean, when I started out as a director, there were hardly any female directors, oh, yeah. even in the 80s. And that was like, I had this amazing high school drama teacher who was male who thought it was great. And then I got to college and all my male teachers oh, yeah. were thinking it was not so yeah, great. Like, yeah. it was just a weird combination and I kept going back and forth. Um, so that in and of itself, having women in power is one thing. But also, I think on a more subtle level, it's just about how we're perceived and perceiving and, and how we present things. And it's not that all, all women are not the same, obviously you're not creating the same kind of work, so that's right. But it's just being part of the full human experience. And in fact, the bit that I was gonna read yeah. has to do with that about, about how, um, this is my newest piece called On the Edge of a Cure, and about how the male point of view has been 
considered normal. It's like that's normal, so any female point of view is abnormal. It's true in the medical sciences as well, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. It's one of the reasons why medicine is so difficult for women because mm -hmm. it's like the the, the, the oh, normal the, yeah, yeah. the normal body is yeah. a male body most tests are done on men you know so all of these things and so you know when you start getting to that and you start looking at how how endemic that is to how we perceive ourselves and each other if you can address that through embodiment see that's where embodiment is important i could give you an essay about this forever who cares but if you see it differently i think that that creates an experiential thing that shifts uh -huh. perception and so and you have something you wanted to read on that I line do. Oh, no, because <laughs> <laughs> it's a miracle. Um, this, I, I'm going to read a bit of this on the panel about okay. women in the arts. Um, okay. This piece is called On the Edge of a Cure. It's mm -hmm. my most recent piece. The way I write, um, I'll just show people for a second just so they can see. I don't write scenes and characters. I write uh, kind of a text palette. So there you go. I'm going to read this in a second. Um, and th there's going to be seven people doing this, what I'm about to read, okay. <laughs> um, and it'll be quick, but it'll give you an idea of how characters sort of come in and out of the piece. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to just start, it's near the beginning, um, and this is a piece that I wrote in response to the Me Too movement in that I felt like some of this could be heard. Okay. Perfect. So these are, I'm, I'm reading voices that would be said by seven actors now. It's the women I listen to now. I used to listen to the men. It was hard not to since they were the only voices heard or read in school, in history, in philosophy, even 90% of the time in literature. The odd woman poked through, looked at not dissimilarly to a toadstool in the middle of a mowed lawn. Wow, Pete, wonder how that got there. Dunno, Jeff, it looks so, you know, odd. It must be like, you know, an exceptional toadstool. Yes, Pete, I'd have to agree. It's not normal that much, I know, because look, all the rest of it is a moan lawn for Pete's sake. Ha ha. Pete looks at Jeff with a small smile. They move on. Mm -hmm. Jeff looks back at the toadstool. Maybe it's sort of interesting, though, don't you think, Pete? I mean, at least it's, you know, different. Yeah, Jeff, it's different, but I don't think it really concerns us, do you? Jeff considers this for a moment, takes a sip of beer, then shakes his head. Nah, you're right. It's just weird. So... Normal is male. There's nowhere else to go unless you want to be a weird toadstool, which, of course, I was. Any woman who writes or dares to lift her head above any parapet is. So best to just, you know, read the men, listen to them, learn the code. Try to, you know, pass. Pass? Yes, pass. Writing that can be male approved because it's in relation to the mown lawn. Lawn? Lawn, canon, whatever. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> And so that was before the Me Too movement? Or that well, this is, I mean, this was just me introducing. It goes into, this piece goes into a, a, a woman trying to uh, articulate some abuse in, the, in, in her deep past as a small child and, um, and having a very hard time doing that because it's all fragmented and it's blurry and it's difficult. So before we go diving into that raw stuff is this whole creating the palette of to open the, to break to to break to break the wall a little bit to, to, to uh, uh, be able to uh, not think as a formal as this look to be want to be right and also to just show that this is the world this is coming up into is a world where uh, this that voice is not heard you know um there is a woman named Lee Gilmore who writes a lot about this and mm -hmm. writes um, in The Limits of Autobiography mm -hmm. and another book, its name I can't remember, which is horrible, but she writes a lot about how women's voices are pushed down by the law, by patriarchal law, oh, right, right. and that what is considered authority, who has the authority, literally author, authority, you know, uh, is, is contested. And with women in, in all kinds of law and in courts, they're just not believed. I mean, if you were raped, God help you, because you're going to be the victim oh, yeah, again, yeah. you know, in a court. And it's very complicated it's because it's, the voice is not here. The, 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 even the conflict or the, the, uh, the act in itself is not recognized. Uh, no, no, it's a very... Uh, yeah, it's a and, and so there's not even words, right? Exactly. And so it's how do you articulate something that can't even be articulated? 
and yet, as Lee Gilmore says, and I agree, must be articulated. So you're stuck in this paradox. Mm -hmm. So back to why women in the arts, I think it's women are trying to articulate using words, and in this case, there's going to be a lot of physical movement and music, you know, using any kind of ways to bring that reality forth from not the male point of view. And I, like I mentioned there about trying to pass, that's something women have been talking about recently, that even when we start writing, we're writing from this kind of inadvertently male point of view and how long it takes you to find your own actual language and that you're not just trying to kind of fit in yeah, to a preconceived canon. Where, where do you think this, what is the image of the future? What, what's, what's coming? No, because it's true, it's, it's like uh, uh, we cannot copy something where already exists, mm -hmm. so what is, what's going to be tomorrow exactly. is it's, it's still unknown. How do you see it? How do I see it? Uh, how do you see the future? How do I see the future? Oh, 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 please. Um, no. <laughs> if you had a <laughs> no, crystal ball. Uh, well, what I do see, actually, I am very hopeful because I see people like AOC, you know, yeah. it just changing the, the whole way that politics is happening just through her embodiment. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm just mm -hmm. a big person. She's just, she embodies yeah. herself. She's not trying to be a man, yeah. Yeah. nor is she trying to be a woman. She's yeah. just herself. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that is huge shift. It's just, it's like a more of a massive perceptual shift than we even can imagine at this point. And I think that the young women I see that I've taught that are coming up, there's there's a new confidence yeah. and there's a new, just like, of course you're going to listen to me, you know, like, of course. And there's women mentors now. There's yeah. women, I'm, I'm a mentor to a yeah. lot of people and yeah. there's yeah. a lot of women now that weren't there when I was coming mm -hmm. up. So I feel like that's going to shift things over time. You have a presentation in few few weeks of. Um, yes. Can you describe a little bit more of what's happening? Yes, um, we're gonna. I've got the little thing to okay. show if you want. Yep. Of course, it's all smushed because I'm not ready for television. But okay, so <laughs> the Rogue Players. I don't know where I'm supposed to do yeah, this. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, um, is is presenting on the edge of a cure, which is the piece um, May third through the fifth at the Playroom, which is on Midtown. Um, it's going to be kind of a workshop staged reading, uh, and we're rehearsing it a lot, but the actors are still going to have the text, and it will be the beginning of a process of bringing this to life. And if anyone wants to come, they should. Uh, it'll be an interesting experience, and I've got incredible actors, that I've some of whom I've worked with for well over 20 years. And so it's open. I mean, if I put the information, yep. we can publish yep. it, and then yes. you can people can come. Yeah, and that, they can go to that website, and it's uh, pay what you can. So money is no object. We'd okay. rather have you than your money. Okay. I mean, you and your you money can, is you great, can get but like. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm not going to stop it. I'm <laughs> not going to stop the money, but you know, whatever. Yeah. So. So much for coming. Thank you so much for. I really appreciate it. I, I do too. Thank you. So that was your uh, show face to face and please keep watching your news on presenza.com and hope to uh, see you very soon. Thank you.